G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Alan Milts from Cashflow Story and he's currently based in Melbourne, Victoria in lockdown. And thanks for your time today, Alan. Thank you so much, Troy. Lockdown is amazing. <laughs> Don't be, uh, when you go for a walk, you think you've been on an outing. Yeah, it feels like a holiday, doesn't it? <laughs> Unbelievable. So let's start with how we know each other. A good friend of mine, Matthew Will, who was on podcast number three here for, on Grow a Small Business a bit over a year ago, he sat in on the seminar that you spoke at, the Entrepreneurs Program, which Polly um, was running here in Hobart. So he was really impressed with not just the subject matter that you were speaking about, but also your energy and your passion and particularly your business experience. So um, really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Troy. It's an absolute pleasure to speak to your wonderful, fast-growing audience. Hopefully, we can share some pearls of wisdom today. Yes. Tell our audience a bit about your business. Okay, so let me give you a background because they've all morphed into the other. If, as you can tell from my accent, I hope I haven't lost it as yet. It's a very strong Melbourne accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a South African uh, chartered accountant by heritage. Mm -hmm. I've been living in Australia now for about 30 years. I was brought over by a clothing company called Esprit. So my background was finance, but my family in South Africa were in the fashion industry. We had a very large ladies footwear manufacturing plant. So we made upmarket ladies footwear and uh, I didn't believe in the politics of apartheid. Yep. And I saw Australia as such a beautiful blue sky opportunity. So Esprit brought me over and I worked at Esprit. I was in charge of Esprit footwear. Mm -hmm. so I actually designed the Esprit shoes, but my background was finance. And then I realized I was unemployable. I had to be my own boss. Yep. And I started to advise the clothing industry. So three of us got together. We were all South African accountants. And at that time, the clothing, the textile clothing, footwear, the automotive sector had a lot of protection, import duties, quotas. And we realized that the government was called the button plan, was going to lift protection. And if you didn't change your business, you weren't going to survive. Yep. So over the next few years, we went to hundreds of companies, spoke to the CEOs, spoke to the accountants, and something resonated with us. Business spoke one language and the bank spoke another language. Yep. Business spoke Spanish and the bank spoke Portuguese. <laughs> and it sounded the same, but it was different. And we couldn't believe that no one understood numbers in a consistent way. Mm -hmm. Every bank was using an analysis tool developed by the ratings agency Moody's. Yes. So the three of us got together and thought we could do something better than Moody's, mm -hmm. which was crazy at the time. Audacious. Hmm. Absolutely audacious. So we created a software company called InMatrix and developed a product called Optimist. Our audience was primarily the banks. The first bank who bought our software was the National Australia Bank, and we beat Moody's to the deal. Um, today, every single bank in Australia uses my system. Wow, great. So any company who applies for a loan as a business is put through my system in a bank. Fantastic. And what year was that that you founded that company? That was about 20 plus years ago. Right. And then we raised private equity. Mm -hmm. So Australia's wealthiest family backed us. And the goal was to take the optimist product globally. Right. So today the system's being used by about 500 blank banks around the world, including some of the biggest banks like Wells Fargo. And, but I made mistakes along the way. <laughs> yep. We raised private equity and we got diluted. 
Right. So when you raise private equity, it's the person who's got the money normally who's got the power. So we got we raised a lot of different capital raises because this was an absolute eating machine for money. For cash, yeah. For cash, the way we grew. But we sold the company eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And today it's one of the biggest banking systems in the world. So well done. My claim to fame is yes, I've influenced the banking sector, yep. but we should have done it slower and had a different philosophy. Just back on something you said a minute ago, reminds me of, I'm not sure, have you heard of the golden rule? No, I haven't. So the man who has the gold makes the rules, basically. That's exactly what it is. Yep, yep. So when you guys diluted down, so you, you lost control, you, you went under 50%? We went under 50%, yep. absolutely. The family was absolutely an amazing family. It really was wonderful people to work with. However, what I always say to founders, the reason you founded a company is that you've got unique DNA. Yes. Once you start to change and dilute that DNA, the magic starts to disappear. So after we sold the company, one of the founders and myself started another technology company called Cashflow Story. Mm -hmm. And our target market was business, was the coaches, business, and it was all about simplicity. The numbers, and I'm an accountant, so I can laugh at my profession. Yeah. The more complex we make things as accountants, the more sophisticated we think we are. Mm -hmm. If we can produce a reports for a board meeting or a management meeting that no one understands, people look at us and say, wow, this is seriously complex. Yep. This is so difficult, such a sophisticated person. So we adopted the philosophy is a good leader. One of my, one, one of my favorite mentors in the world is an ex is the ex CEO of one of the big banks in Asia. He also ran the insurance company called Great Eastern Life. He's in his eighties, mid eighties, and he calls me every Friday. Wow! And he ten x the company and knew nothing about insurance and banking. Hmm. And when I said to him, "What made you such a great leader?" His name's Alan Pathmaraja. Alan said to me, "How do you spell leader?" <laughs> L-E-A-D-E-R. He said, the first thing I do as a leader is L is for listen. I'm a great listener. And he said to me, do you realize listen and silent are the same letters? When I'm listening to people, I'm silent. Think about the leaders in your company. Are they the first to talk or are they good listeners? Mm. And then he said, I listen with E, with empathy. I always take off my shoes when I talk to someone and I put on their shoes. So when we developed cash flow story, we put on the shoes of the non-financial management team and said, we're going to develop concepts about how to make better, improved decisions that you will understand. Just to finish leader quickly. Yes. L-E-A, he always had a positive attitude. Mm -hmm. L-E-A-D, never scared to make, make tough decisions. Yes. E, he knew how to energize the company, enthuse. And then R was resilience, like a coil. As a leader, your business goes up and down. Yep. It's not how far you drop, it's how quickly you bounce back. That's so my great. message to your audience, are you guys leaders? Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> I've never heard that before, but I think that, that will resonate with the audience. That's great. Yeah. Mm. So today, cash flow story is in 96 countries around the world. So we've got we've got over 40,000 plus scorecards, entities using it. Yep. And we've really, we honestly believe we're gonna change the way people look at numbers. And my absolute purpose today is to make everyone on the management team love the numbers, understand, and understand how to improve your performance. Fantastic, that's great. And when you made the jump, uh, 20 years ago with the first business how old were you when you decided uh, that uh, you were unemployable um I, you know what Troy if I hadn't emigrated to Australia I was unemployable in my early 20s right <laughs> some people are just born where you're not good in having someone telling you what to do you prefer to 
have a vision, whether you're successful or not, you just want to make sure it works. Yeah, yeah. And do you have any key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of, of either of those businesses or both of them? Well, I, the first business, obviously, when we sell it, I don't want to mention the numbers and whatever. Yeah. I don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. But um, as I said today, when I looked last, it's been sold now for the second time, the company. And the company who bought us was a business called SunGuard, a big technology company. And they sold to a business called FIS. So we were a percentage of, SI, of, of SunGuard's business. And I think the company was sold for $7 billion. Wow. Yeah. Huge. yeah. So we would have been maybe 5 or 10% of that. Yeah. Fantastic. What yeah. about uh, full-time equivalents when you started? It was the three of you that started that business and, and kind of what you got to when you exited? Well, we had, we had about 40 or 50 people working for us. Mm -hmm. But then, obviously, we had distributors in every country. Yeah. So, you know, when you're selling technology and selling technology to banks are very long lead times, it's two to three years, your lead time in selling software to a bank. So we had some of the most sophisticated distributors around the world. And cash flow story, was it just the two of you that started that? So two FTE? It was three of us. So three, three of us started it. Mm. It was um, the original founder, myself. And mm. then we, we got as a partner, a technology specialist. Right. So, and what's the FTE up to now, the number of full-time equivalents of cash flow? Also, we got... We got partners around the world so we've moved away from just employing people because because we're a global business we're in 96 countries yeah we've yeah. got people all over the world who are representing cash flow story who are distributing our product yep Great. so we don't need a lot of people that's the beauty with technology you know people I mean, earlier today, we were having a chat and you mentioned the book, Good to Great, Getting mm -hmm. the Right People on the Bus. Yep. So Jim Collins uses the concept of the flywheel. Yep. You know, great companies have got a flywheel that's just spinning so fast. And when you ask the, the owner, when did it start to spin? The answer is there was no point in time. It just, it's all these activities you do every day every month, every quarter. Yep. It's the repetition mm. of the activities that you're continually oiling your flywheel. Yeah. So we've been doing this for, this has been my life. Cash flow story is the culmination of 30 years work. Yep, great. And you started that eight years ago after selling out? We sold it about, we started about six years ago. Right, great. And I do want to touch on speaking of books because you are a co-author of one of my favorite authors and, and the book, the book used to be called Rockefeller Habits, but now it's, what's it now called? Scaling Up by Scaling Vern Harnish. Vern Harnish, yeah. Great stuff. And I think I've mentioned the book a few times on the cast, so I really encourage the audience to, to have a look at that. It's, it's a wonderful framework. And you, you wrote the cash flow part of that book, didn't you? Correct. So Vern who's one of the great thought leaders of our time. And Troy, thank you. I get no royalties from the book. Yep. But out of every book that I've read, for your audience, you have to read it. It's an absolute brilliant book on how to scale up a company. So yep. Vern says, as a leader, as a company who wants to grow, there are four decisions you need to master. People. So... People, strategy, execution, and then cash. Definitely. Mm. So Vern approached thought leaders in each one of the areas. And you've got some of the really great minds in the world who have contributed towards this brilliant book. And it's, it's a, such a great methodology how to scale. It is. I read it when it was called Rockefeller Habits probably 12, 15 years ago now. A client of mine put me onto it and I just nearly fell off my chair. It just resonated everything the way I think about growing small businesses um, it was you know all encapsulated in, in that book so thank you for contributing and and the one lesson I've I've learned you will never achieve cash flow excellence without people excellence yes mm. so your business is no different to a sporting match there's a score everyone in your company needs to understand the score and then the technique which we've developed 
there's only seven things a management team can do financially to improve your score. And we call it the power of one. Price, volume, margins, and overheads. So there are four profit levers. Yep. And there are three levers, which I call your working capital drivers. Receivable days, inventory days, or in a service company, work in progress days, and how you pay your suppliers. Yep. So these seven drivers are the inputs into your business. Every quarter in every board that I sit on, everyone knows the revenue, the margins, the profit, the working capital, the cash of a company. And then we have a discussion called the improvement around the seven levers of the power of one. Yep. But no surprises. Everyone knows the score. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? When's the moment I felt like I said it's a great question? I haven't yet. Yep. At, the, at, at, at the moment, every I do a lot of public speaking around the world. And one of the one of the things that you raised earlier is that your friend who recommended me mm -hmm. said I had passion. Every single time I present and every time I speak to a business, in my heart. I know this works. I know this is right. So my passion is every single day. How many people can I touch? Yeah. And say to them, if you can become a storyteller of numbers, you will understand your business better. Revenue is vanity. Profit is sanity. Cash is king or queen. Yes. It's reality, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think it's such an under trained or underrepresented part of a lot of growing small businesses is the numbers and knowing the numbers and not just the financial person in the corner knowing the numbers but you're absolutely right the wider team everyone needs to be more educated and on these on these important um, numbers and it's interesting Troy Vern Harnish when a couple of Vern's statements resonate with me the one thing Vern normally starts off his talks he says the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> yeah. So in other words, when you look at business, everyone listening today, what is your main thing that you need to fix? Is it people, strategy, execution, and cash? Yeah. And then Vern says, as leaders, we need to have three traits. Ability to predict. So think about your company. You're doing budgets, actual versus budget, quarterly, monthly. How accurate are you? I know when I sit on a board and a company gets it wrong every quarter, there's something fundamentally wrong with the leadership team. Yep. Then Vern says, as a leader, you need to have the ability to delegate. Get a team of A players below you. A players want to win the game. Get a team of A players to implement what you want. Yep. And then the last thing Vern says is repeat, repeat, repeat. Get the three or four things that need to be done every quarter for the year. Repeat, repeat, repeat until people mock you. <laughs> so I'm saying every quarter we need to discuss in business your profitability. How are we going? What's happening in working capital? Your receivables, your inventory, your payables. The result of your business is your cash. Cash flow is actually the most simple calculation. It's the movement in your bank accounts. Yep. It's the movement in all your bank accounts. So look at your profit, compare it to your cash, and then say to yourself, if I'm a good business person, I want to make more cash. Seven levers, price, volume, margins, overheads, receivables, inventory, payables. Yes. Implement the power of one in your business. What does success look like to you? Success to me looks like every single company who interacts with me says, I want to adopt cash flow excellence into my business. I want to create a culture where people understand the numbers and people know how to fix it. So... <laughs> number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business the number one thing again ask yourself in your business so 
So many companies I see, Troy, are growing broke. You can your revenue is growing, but your cash flow is getting worse and worse. So what you need to do is to understand the story of your numbers and get your financial ratios right or your mm -hmm. financial story right that volume is producing cash because so many companies say i've got the strategy to grow and then i say do you realize the cash flow impacts yes no idea yep. all i look at is profit yeah so your business is like reading a murder mystery there's four chapters in the story we business are reading chapter one profit over and over again and wonder why we don't understand our cash. Earlier today, I said business speaks Spanish, the bank speaks Portuguese. Mm -hmm. The business is looking at their profit. The bank's looking at your cash flow as measured by your capacity to repay. Yes. Yeah. So I'm saying to business, if you understand your bank, you will understand your business better. Yes. You need to become cash flow focused. So, great. My message, so my message to business is people, strategy, execution, cash. Do you have all of them working in, in, um, in harmony? And how did you fund both businesses? Well, the first business, we, we funded through raising private equity. Mm -hmm. The second business, we took the exact opposite approach. We said we're going to fund it on our own. We said we're going to go slower. We're going to raise no capital. We're not going to get diluted. And instead of having to raise serious capital to fund the development, we gave our development team a percentage of the equity. Very smart. And we said to them, this is our track record. We've done this before. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be part of a journey that could be worth serious dollars one day? Mm -hmm. Work for nothing and develop this product. And now the product is obviously very profitable because that's an annual um, recurring revenue. Yes. We've got no, we don't have a lot of overheads. And now everyone who got involved is thanking us because it's an absolute beautiful journey in terms of cash flow. And it's win-win because you're also then, the developers are really engaged with your journey because it's, it's from my experience, I've got a few tech companies or had them in the past, it's really hard to find good developers that will do what they say they will deliver on time and on budget and not with the complexity you need. You just you put the scope out there and, and they deliver it. It's actually quite hard to find those, those A players in that corner of a business. And also try to raise equity or private equity in any country is extremely difficult. difficult. Hmm. You know, probably only about two to 5% of companies are successful. Mm -hmm. yep. And when, when, when we were raising it, you know, I made a bit of a study of what, what do you need to be successful? And, and I use the word mover, yep. M-O-V-E-R. The first thing an investor looks at is M, your management team. Do you have a management team who can prove their track record that someone will back? People are backing you. Yes. The next thing I look at is, O, oh, your opportunity. Once people are happy with your management team, your opportunity doesn't have a proven um, blue sky. Yes. Is there a high barrier to entry? MOV, what's your valuation? So if you think your value is 10 million, but an investor thinks it's two, you'll never do a deal. Mm -hmm. If ever you're going to raise money, MOVE, how are you going to exit this business? And all the boards that I sit on, right up front, we're looking at who's going to buy this business in three years. Doesn't mean you're going to sell, no. but how are we going to optimize the value? Yes. And then the last one is R, return. An investor, if you're a going concern, wants at least 30% return per annum mm -hmm. in a going concern and about 50% in a startup company. Right. Doesn't mean you pay dividends. But it means in a startup, you'll triple someone's money every two and a half years. Yes. And that's yeah. why most people don't raise money because they're not movers. Yep. I think I know the answer to this one. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Well, as I said to you, my purpose, I know what. So if you look at Jim Collins and the flywheel, he uses a concept called the hedgehog concept. Mm-hmm. What can you be the best at the world at? What drives your economic, I'm trying to remember all the fun things now. 
what drives your economic engine and what are you passionate about? Yes. Yeah. So if I look at all those components, what I'm doing at the moment, I believe I can create a hedgehog for myself. And so a hedgehog might be slow moving, but they're very well protected. Yeah. And can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Well, the most, it's always when we had our investors and we were growing this business through capital injection all the time, it made me feel sick in the stomach that every time you had to go and say to someone, we need more money, cash flow is tight, our cash burns too fast. And that made me sick. So every single board that I sit on today, my own company, I, I'm saying to business, build a fortress balance sheet. The interesting thing was during COVID, some companies got really smashed. Mm -hmm. If you were in the wrong segments. Yep. But I can tell you now, a lot of business in Australia is doing better today than they were pre-COVID. Yes. Never before has numbers been more important. Everyone in your management team needs to embrace the numbers and know what they can do to make better decisions to improve your profit, your cash, and your value. So my message to all the listeners today, embrace the numbers, implement the power of one, and as a gift to your audience, they can have access to my technology at no cost for the next month to implement the power of one. So www. I will send you a link. Yeah, we'll put in the show notes. Yeah, that'd be great. You can send to the audience and they can download the cash flow story. Yep. And they can, and I'll tell you what they need to actually enter Mm -hmm. to get the power of one. And what area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Well, the first thing I've, I've realized is to surround myself with people who have got different skills to me. Yeah. Mm. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> Absolutely. So whenever I sit on the board or I, or I do something, I've always got someone with a different skill base to me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, two heads are better than one. Mm-hmm. No surprises. Yeah. Everyone has the right to be heard in a non-threatening way. So that's absolutely critical. The family who invested in us held us very clearly. Two heads are better than one. Everyone has the right to be heard in a non-threatening way. The truth will be told. But the key message was, tell us the bad news. Yes. If you don't have that that transparency, it's great that the family were on the front foot on this to build the culture of failure. And, you know, so those mistakes and, and risks can be brought to the level, just discussed, decisions made, then you move on people didn't feel as if they'd be persecuted. That's such an important thing to build into any culture in a growing business. Absolutely. And it's interesting, Troy, one of the really best bits of advice that I see from scaling up is when you're looking at people, so what does an A player look like? An A player is a person who lives the values of the company and a person who's achieving their KPIs. Yep. So every company needs to define their values. This is your DNA. Yes. You hire on values, you fire on values. Mm -hmm. So so often you walk into companies and they say, well, our values are honesty, integrity, and they all sound the same. Get values that are unique to your business. Mm -hmm. It's your language. And then make sure every single person in your company lives these values. Every month have a core value award. Start to build up core value stories. But a B player is a person who lives the values, not productive. A BC is a dangerous person. They, they perform, but it's all about them. Mm-hmm. Or they're and, then a, and then a C player not performing, not living your values. Yes. Mm -hmm. Every board meeting, every quarter, we put names in each box. And then we got strategies to convert the Bs, Mm -hmm. the BCs into A, and we always exit the Cs. Yep. Yeah. 
Great. The worst thing you can do to an A player is surround them with an idiot. Oh, absolutely. They they get just get so frustrated and, and shitty and decide to move on, and then you know it just exacerbates the problem. You get more Bs and Cs on the bus. Exactly. What have you enjoyed least about managing the fast growth? If I work with people who think they know everything, mm -hmm. yeah. So the companies I love to work with are people who become or like sponges. Yes. You give them an idea. You go back and they've not only implemented what you said, but they've done it better than what you even suggested. And my absolute thrill is our company. So my typical benchmark is what can we do to get double industry benchmark in our performance? Yep, that's good. And that's so, so it's, 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 it's such an interesting exercise. When, when a company says to me, join the board, these are all SMEs. Mm -hmm. I don't work for publicly listed companies where it's about statutory. Yep. I always say to the company on day one, if someone came to you in three years time, what is the size of the checkbook that you would walk for? Mm -hmm. And then we put that down and then we say, let's do evaluation today. And then you say, okay, this is the gap we have to fix over the next three years. Yep. So evaluation is based upon a multiple of earnings. Yes. So then you can map out over the next three years, what are you going to do to grow your revenue, your margin, your profit? And then what are you going to do to differentiate your company to get your multiple higher? Yep. Yep. And what do you love most about growing a small business? I love seeing a business run in color code green. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you asked me a few times today, what does success look like? I love to define what does success look like in your business? What does Color Code Green look like in revenue, margins, profit, receivables, inventory, payable cash? And when you can start to teach a company to run in Color Code Green, cash is the result of growth. You need money when you grow. You also need money when you're not running the company properly. So we can, if we can teach companies to run in color code green, they can become cash machines. And that's what gives me great joy. Right. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your business growth journey? How little I know. Every single day of my life when I attend another seminar or I meet another great CEO, I realize I've got so much more to learn. Yeah. So that's just... The more I know, or the more I learn, the realize I realize very clearly Hell I've still got so yeah. much more to go in this journey, and that's why I've got so much passion still. Yeah, great. What's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? I think I know the answer to this one. Routine sets you free. Yep. So you read Rockefeller Habits. What are the daily, the weekly, the monthly, the quarterly rhythms that your business needs to implement? The other thing is, I promise you, your business will be a very different business if you get the right people on the bus. Yes, absolutely. Mm. You will never achieve cash flow excellence without people excellence. Do you love talking small business growth with other owners? We have a vibrant online community from many industries around the world. Plus, we regularly add new tools and resources for community members and host two webinars a month to help you grow your small business. GrowSmallBusiness.com Can you talk to on that? Can you talk to how you, you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening over the years? Well, the first thing is we are very clear in creating what I call job scorecards. Mm-hmm. So most companies give their people a job description. This is what you will do in your job. A job scorecard is what does success look like in your job? You will achieve the following outcomes. It's outcome driven. Yep. A players want to be happy, challenged, and winning. Yes. So we need to define what winning means to your A players. Then we need to give them the ammunition and the education to teach them how to win the game. The other lesson that I'm saying, the more your management team learns and reads, the better they will be. 
So get a little library and start to get certain books that you all read simultaneously. Get scaling up. Get Good to Great by Jim Collins. Start with a little library of must-read books. I totally agree, Alan. A lot of the, the coaching I have done over the years, I'm firstly amazed that fast-growing companies don't have an org chart or a job description for a start. And secondly, they don't have those KPIs, uh, you know, the job scorecard that you speak of for each role, for someone to be focusing on one or two numbers or key levers in the business. And then thirdly, the, the lack of investment in professional development across the wider team. Um, so that's something I advocate is always have for each role, one thing that that person should be developing in the quarter. And you, you both may agree to either it's a book or a course, an online course that you may need to do or go and attend a seminar, et cetera, to get their experience and skill level and knowledge up to where it needs to be in three months' time. Absolutely. And where I met some of the audience in Tasmania is the government through the Entrepreneurs Program was running this amazing session. Mm -hmm. And um, all your audience... Maybe you and I can talk offline. We can develop a little masterclass in finance yeah. for, for your audience. That'd be great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And what are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? So, again, kick-ass culture, define your values. Yeah. Number one, I would do define your values, not just words, but actual, this is part of your DNA. So one of the companies, I'll give you an example of what core values are. I work, I'm on the board of a company who does cladding, cladding on buildings. Mm -hmm. Everyone will tell you a price sensitive industry. Mm -hmm. We've got four core values. The first core value is very, very good for the customer, V-E-D-D-Y. When we were workshopping the, um, the values, Vinny in the factory, who was from Vietnam, couldn't say the word R. He said, everything we do here has to be very good for the customer. <laughs> so that's right. one of our first core values. Yep. The next core value is the A team. When we go to a building site, everyone wears a T-shirt saying the A team. Yep. Everyone laughs at us. They say, if this is your A team, when's, when's your B team coming? <laughs> Now, the only way you can wear this T-shirt is if you can actually put up double the amount of square meters per day on a building with the best quality. Wow. So we are the A team. Hmm. The next core value is every day is a Friday. Yep. On Friday, we have a barbecue. It's a happy day. Yes. Anyone who comes to work in our company who looks miserable, the staff always says every day is a Friday. Yeah. Yep. And the last core value is when you walk into the factory, it says making swarf. Swarf is like sawdust coming off metal, shavings coming off metal. These four core values, no one in the world's got them. Yeah. So when you develop your core values, it's what is your DNA. Totally agree. I think a lot of people... The culture around that. Yeah, I think a lot of people go short on core values and you could argue that Jim Collins is the godfather of um, vision, mission, values, et cetera, when he, you know, early 90s, when he wrote uh, Being Entrepreneurial and then Built to Last before Good to Great. But it can, it, it's easy to get wrong because people just kind of gloss over it, do a half day, um, you know, half ass job at it. But it is so, so important to invest that time to get to the true DNA of, to, 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 to discover your genuine core values. Exactly. You're higher on values, you fire on values. But so one of the other companies I work, I work for, um, we're a fairly well-known construction company in Melbourne, boutique construction called CoBuild, mm -hmm. beautiful company. And our main core value is called the coffee test. We will never employ a person who fails a coffee test, however good they are. We'll never take on a new customer who takes on who fails a coffee test. So core values, getting your culture and your people is absolutely critical to getting your financial excellence right. Totally agree. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. I, do, I make sure I do an hour of exercise every day. That's absolutely critical. And um, 
my, my beautiful friend, Alan, who was who I mentioned earlier, who was the head of the bank and the insurance company, he, he asks me that question. He calls me every single Friday night at the same time. And the conversation starts off, are you balancing your life? That's good. And then he says to me, Alan, you used to travel so often. You're now at home. Do you realize the importance of family? And he says, do you know what family means? And I say, no. He says, F-A-M-I-L-Y, father and mother, I love you. <laughs> I tell my, my son every single Friday, don't forget family. And then he says, without traveling, make sure at home you have a mutual relationship with your wife or your partner where you become the mute. Yep. So I'm the mute at home these days. <laughs> That's good. Brilliant. And you've spoken a little bit about uh, your mentors. Any other mentors or coaches along your journey you want to talk about? Well, well, Vern Harnish has certainly had a major impact on my life. Just being exposed on a continual basis to thought leaders around the world that you pick up a little nugget from each one of them and, and it resonates. So I love learning, Troy. The more I learn, as I said to you, the, the luckier I get. Um, I'm the same. I just love reading it, coming across a good book or content or even just a, a saying like you've introduced me to some pearls today and yeah. it just widens your perspective and deepens your knowledge. And what about, do you have a board of directors or advisors at Cashflow Story at the moment? Well, Cashflow Story, <laughs> we've got, I would call it the three stooges. <laughs> we are three unusual guys yeah. who which makes us so different. So everything we do, we challenge the world, the way people have done it historically, and it just works for us. For us, this is not a business. It's our passion. It's part of our life. We probably phone each other, the one uh, partner and I, we phone each other 10 times a day. And if we have an argument, within five minutes, it's forgotten. It. So, yeah. do you know, for me, it's not about work. It's about how many new people have seen our our system or process or how many new countries have we got into the money is irrelevant to us i can tell you we just love the journey yeah great and you're one of the few that i've had on that's exited a business so any other comments or advice for those uh, that may be thinking of exiting soon or eventually which hopefully all our audience are any advice for them on what you learned from your exit well the first thing i've learned from exit is don't plan for it six months in advance. I'm always thinking three years out. Right. What do we need to do to optimize the profit, the cash, the value of the company? How, what are you going to do to gamify your business? Mm -hmm. So when someone's going to buy it, they say, this is why this company is getting double industry benchmark. I'm prepared to pay a much bigger multiple. So every company I'm working with, it's about double the industry benchmark. Right. What do you do to be you to be unique in people strategy execution cash? All right, Alan, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Growing from from a small business where you don't do everything yourself, where you've got to let go. Mm -hmm. Ability to delegate. Some people are like an octopus, they've got to do everything. No one can do it as well as you. As I said, there are a lot of people out there who can do it better than you. They're just not working for you. Favorite business book, which has helped you the most? Scaling up. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Well, I'm a member of the Growth Institute. So mm -hmm. Vern Harnish has got a business called the Growth Institute. And there, all the people we've mentioned today have got so much content on there. They've got brilliant online courses. So I use the Growth Institute a lot. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Um, power of one. And final, my favorite question. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? However long you think it's going to take, double it and double the amount of cash you're going to need because even that will be optimistic. Have you heard of the rule of four by two? <laughs> no. As a VC actually in London, when I was living in London, I heard speak and in Australia here, a four by two is just a plank of wood, you know, four inches yeah. by two inches. 
And he said, uh, he, obviously, they get hit up for their money a lot by entrepreneurs. And he, he always has this rolls out the four by two rule to them and says it's going to take four times as long and cost twice as much or take twice as long and cost four times as much. The only difference is you get to choose which path you take. And I think that really sums it up. Exactly right. But love what you do. Do yeah. it for the right reasons. Mm. And if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Love that saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you, Alan, for your time today. The audience, I know, will get a lot of value out of um, your journey and what you've shared with us. And, and also, thank you for the offer to let them in to have a look um, for 30 days. We'll put that in the show notes. I really appreciate the time. And if you're back down in Hobart, it'd be great to have a beer with you. Thanks so much, Troy. And everyone, whether you're in lockdown or you're walking around freely, I'm very jealous. But best of luck to everyone in 2021. And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 